Good morning, Wellspring. It's amazing to see all of you. Let's stand and worship together. falls under your lordship, that there's not a piece of this earth that has gone rogue. Instead, you command all things, Lord. We thank you that we worship you, that we are on your team, God. That you've redeemed us, you've saved us from our own sin, and here we are worshiping your holy name. And Lord, we look forward to the day you take us, Lord, and you defeat sin, and you take us into your presence, and we reign with you forever, God. We just thank you, we love you. Help us to be expectant. Uh, of you and your power in the world that we live in today, Lord, as we command and we go out into nations and we call all to repent, Lord, because that's what you have commanded nations, not us. And you have sent us to do your work in that way, Lord. So just be with us as we open your word today, as we worship your name, and just pray that you would turn our eyes up to you, Lord, and that we would be your people and you'd be our God. And we ask that in your name. And everybody said, 
Amen. Let's take some time and greet each other this morning. Yeah.
My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or that flow at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him no other, the soul is satisfied in Him. Summer flowers. As summer flowers we fade and die, fame, youth, and beauty hurry by. But life eternal calls to us at the cross. Will not boast. I will not boast in. That the light of Christ 
might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Teach us, Lord. Teach us, Lord, through your obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your pure our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail, let their truth prevail over Father, that is our prayer. As we open your word, would you accomplish what we cannot do on our own? Would you speak to our hearts? Would you heal our unbelief, Lord? Would you forgive us? Would you teach us your truths? Would you apply them directly to our hearts, God? As we hear these things that are tough to the flesh, we can't understand in our own fleshly minds, God, but by your spirit we can. So we just pray that you would unlock that in us, Lord. You deliver your words to our hearts, that we would love it, we would treasure it, Lord. We would treasure your word, treasure what you have said, and treasure you, Lord, that we would worship you and be obedient to what you have commanded your church to do and be, Lord. Just be with us as we read your word. Lord, we just need your help. We need your supernatural help to see the things that we cannot on our own. And Lord, I just pray that we would treasure you above all things in our lives, Lord, that this would be the moment where we look at your words and we would hear them, we would love them, Lord, we would love you, and we would come under your lordship more today than yesterday, than this morning, right now, Lord. Would you bring us near to you? We ask that in your name. And everyone said, amen. You may have a seat. Morning, church. If you would please open your Bibles to Matthew 22. If you're using one of them in the chair, it's on page 983. Can we get house lights? Please. 
And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell them, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their cities. Then he said to the servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Brian. Let's ask the Lord's blessing. Father, speak now as we were singing. We need you to teach us, teach us full obedience, teach us holy reverence, teach us true humility. Save the lost in our midst. Awaken those who are asleep spiritually and complacent. Sanctify the saints and build your church here on earth, God. Through the preaching of your word, as only you can do, we seek you for that now, that you would be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. Well, we come this morning to the parable of the wedding feast. And we're in the last week of Christ's earthly ministry before the cross, right? He entered Jerusalem on that Sunday as the long-awaited Messiah. He came on Monday with authority, cleansing the temple, taking it back for Yahweh. He confronted the religious leaders on their hypocrisy. And he starts warning the Jews of the judgment that's coming. And the religious leaders came back to Christ as he's teaching there in the temple, and they challenged his authority to do such things. And Jesus responds with a series of parables, all pronouncing God's judgment on the people of Israel. And we saw last week in the sermon there, the parable of the two sons and the parable of the wicked tenants. Now today, we come to the parable of the wedding feast, and this is among the most dramatic and powerful of all the parables. And, and while it is specifically addressed here in the text to the religious leaders and, and all unbelieving Israel that they were leading, it has direct application to us today of our need to receive that gospel invitation and to go out and seek the lost before the judgment. And that's our big idea this morning. If you're taking notes, receive the invitation of the gospel and seek to save the lost before The judgment. That's what we're going to learn this morning. Number one for your notes, do not be indifferent or hostile to this gospel. Do not be indifferent or hostile this morning to this good news. Look again at verse one with me. Matthew 22, verse one. Again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Jesus says, this is is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he's using that phrase, kingdom of heaven, in the narrower sense to speak of the realm of salvation. Because we understand the kingdom is that which, which transcends time from the beginning to the end. It's his reign over all things, every atom in the universe, his, right? But we're talking now the realm of salvation. We're talking about the, the spiritual community of the redeemed, those who have submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ, been brought into the body of Christ. That kingdom of heaven, he says, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. So this is a a royal wedding, okay? This is going to be the, you know, the the honorable, majestic king is throwing a wedding feast for his son. So you're you're here in this parable, you're supposed to get the picture that this is going to be 
grand. This is going to be one of those multi-week long festival celebrations. It's going to happen there, of course, in the palace itself. No expense is going to be spared, right? This is going to be the most elaborate, extravagant celebration imaginable as the king throws this for his son. It's for his son. And that's really the point of what Jesus is getting at here. He doesn't mention who the bride is or the the wedding itself, the marriage itself. The point is this is the most extravagant event, celebration to be invited to. Look at verse 3. And the king sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. And so it's time for that celebration to begin, and these servants are sent out to go and, 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 and tell everyone who's been invited it's starting. So these people have already received an invitation. And surely this is no doubt the most honorable privilege to have gotten an invite to this event, right? And no doubt they're now expected to come to this event. But when the servants were sent out from the king to call the guests to the wedding, it says what? They would not come. Now, at this point in the parable, the religious leaders and others are listening. They're, they're thinking, what? That's, that's ridiculous. Why would they do that? Who would ever do that? That's absurd. But they refused to come to the invite. And this whole thing here is a picture of Israel. Israel, who's already been called by God. The invite was sent out long ago. They have the oracles of God and the prophets speaking the word of God. They should have been eagerly anticipating the day of the king's son's honor, his wedding. They should have been waiting for that. But Israel, as we know, has rejected their Messiah. And they're just days away from crucifying him. Now we see here the amazing grace and long suffering of the king as he gives them another chance. Look at verse 4. Again. He sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Now, John MacArthur notes here that few monarchs in that day were known for their humility and patience, especially in the face of open insult. I think history testifies to that. And yet in the parable, here's this king, and he's willing to graciously send out the invite again, right? He's he's seeking to draw them in. Listen, he's even describing to them the menu of what's going to be served, right? Come, it's, it's prepared. My oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered. Come to the feast. And see, this is where Baptists get the idea to serve food at every event, Right? We, and we tell you ahead of time, we got to coax you to get there, right? Finance meeting isn't interesting, right? But there's going to be pie, right? Stay after church today, there's going to be smoked pulled pork, you know? And we're trying to get people to it, which, by the way, that our last newcomer's lunch was fantastic. It was a super blessing. Stay for that next time if we have it. But the whole thing here is a picture of God being lavish. In his promises to Israel, his blessings on Israel, his free, abundant offer of grace to them, blessing a kingdom he wants to give them. He's he's condescending in love to induce them to come in. This is the patience of Yahweh in loving sinners. This is the long suffering of a God that is not willing that any should perish. This is the the, the patience of a God bidding them to come again and again and again. But as we're going to see in this parable, God's patience is temporary. It has an end point. Look at verse 5 with me. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business. That is shocking. And disgraceful. If you think about the story, right? What an offense to the king and his son. They paid no attention, it says. In other words, they were indifferent. They were indifferent. They they were not interested, not concerned, just kind of apathetic. They went off, it says, one to his farm, another to his business, meaning they just kept on doing business as usual. 
caring about their normal business as if the wedding is of no significance to them. Just working the farm, running their business, selfishly preoccupied with life, too busy to stop and attend the king's son's wedding, not concerned with the son's honor, but just their own interests. And we need to feel this morning just how appalling that is. How appalling that is. Indifference to the invitation of the gospel, the king's wedding feast, is a great insult and offense to the honor of the son. Understand this morning, that is rejection of Jesus Christ. Okay? You may not be openly opposed to the gospel today, but your indifference, your cold apathy toward the gospel, the things of God, the call to repentance, the invite to the wedding, that is a rejection of him. It is a rejection because you can't sit on the fence with Jesus. You're either for him or you're against him, right? And if you're not for him, you are against him. And and, and, and he, he is worthy of honor today. So to not give him honor, to not be passionate about the son's honor, to not find your greatest joy in giving the son honor is a denial of his worth and honor. It's a great insult to the glory of God. It's an offense to Almighty God. Therefore, it is a grave sin. It's open rebellion against God. And oh, how many people today in America suffer from a form of unbelief where they are just dead to the things of God, not paying any attention, not concerned, not not upset, just not worth my time. I got, I got better things to do, places to be, aspirations and dreams. I don't need that God stuff in my life. I'm doing fine. These are people who are essentially secular-minded, and they're living like materialists, where life is just about accumulating possessions, and, and you're just finding your joy and your purpose in all the same things as the world and values of the world and ways of the world and, and you're seeking your comfort and power and pleasure and acceptance in the world. And you're not antagonistic against the gospel, just mainly concerned with getting ahead. You don't have time for that. Are you here this morning and is that your heart toward God? Is that you today? If that's not you... Certainly all of us here know somebody like I just described, right? This is exactly what Jesus says it's going to be like in the days before his return. Matthew 24, 37. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as those days before the flood, they were what? Eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood swept them away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Is that you today? Are you going to be swept away in the coming judgment, unaware? Because you're just indifferent, going about your business as usual, attending church every once in a while to stay connected, but your life is essentially the same as every other family in your neighborhood, everyone else that you work with, right? Chasing the American dream, making life as comfortable for you and your family as you possibly can, but no genuine desire for obedience to Jesus Christ, to deny yourself and take up your cross daily, follow him. Is that you today? Do you not realize this morning that everyone was just doing life like you when the flood came and swept them away? And that's how it's going to be for you when the Son of Man returns, a day we know is coming soon. Just as shocking as it would be to see guests turn down this invite to the grand wedding, just as shocking is it that you keep placing everything else before God? And you're indifferent to the gospel and all that it means for your life and your eternity. J.C. Ryle says, open sin may kill its thousands, but indifference and neglect to the gospel kill their tens of thousands. 
Look at verse 6 now. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. So you got two different groups here. Those who were indifferent, just went on their business, and those who were openly hostile to the gospel. Some are indifferent, others get angry. Others get offended that the king would be so persistent with his invitation. And so they say, stop sending these servants, right? They start mistreating them and even killing them. That is an outrageous act of rebellion against the king. These are his servants and you're killing them? But that's exactly what the Israelites were guilty of. They had rejected and mistreated John the Baptist and all the prophets before him. They had rejected and were about to crucify the very Son of God. They were going to persecute the apostles and the prophets of the New Testament church soon and put most of them to death. And it typically is those who are caught up in false religion that that, that become the most violent and aggressive against the gospel. And of course, the secular-minded and you know, dictators of communist countries and everybody else too. But, but those caught up in false religion who are deep in error seem to be the most violently against the truth of the gospel. When you're out sharing Christ on campuses or out on the street, I mean, you see this, you see both of these all the time. You see the appalling indifference and it breaks your heart. And you, and you see the angry opposition and hostility. And all of it breaks your heart because you know the honor of the Son, And you know the great honor of this invitation. And you know the great wrath that awaits those who reject both. Do not be indifferent or hostile to this gospel. If that's you this morning, repent and receive that grace. Receive the gospel invite. Say yes, come in. Be welcomed by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Secondly, for your notes and why this is so important, number two, beware God's judgment for rejecting the gospel. Beware God's judgment for rejecting the gospel this morning. Look at verse seven. The king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murders and burned their city. You see those words, right? The king was angry. And he slaughtered them and he burned the city. So this is quite a story Jesus is telling to make his point here to the Jewish leaders, right? So translate that into our day for a moment so we can feel just what a shocking story Jesus is telling. Imagine this morning that we have um, the governor of Oregon. Okay, wait. First, imagine we have a a respectable, good, godly governor in Oregon, okay? (laughs) I'm going to really stretch your powers of imagination this morning. Imagine we have a a godly governor in Oregon who's a native of Roseburg and well-connected in the community. Most of their political base and connections are here in Roseburg and the supporters are here and and the governor's daughter is going to get married. And so governor comes from a lot of wealth and wealthy family. So they send out 3,000 invitations to this grand wedding that they're going to throw for their daughter. And and now I'm, I'm... as I'm telling you this story, I say, guess what? Every single person turned down the invitation. You, you would be shocked. I mean, you'd be taken aback, right? How rude. How, how rude. Certainly their political supporters and their friends would, would want to attend and show up for their daughter's wedding. But then I, I continue. Not only did they send out these beautiful, elegant invitations to these 3,000 people, but then they... they They took their paid staff and and they sent them out to go hand deliver more invitations to these same people and to give them a personal invite and everyone still turned them down. In fact, some of their staff never returned. Some of them were beaten. Some of them were even killed by these citizens. Now, you'd be hearing that and you'd be thinking, that's crazy. (laughs) You're telling a crazy story, Pastor Brian, right? That that just doesn't make any sense. That, That would never happen. You don't just kill people messengers that are showing up to invite you to a wedding. You just don't do that. Nobody does that. Who does that? And the story gets crazier. What happens next? Well, it's the afternoon of the wedding. Just hours from starting, the governor gets angry and he sends out the National Guard and he slaughters all the people of Roseburg and burns down the whole city. 
Whoa. That is a colossal story Jesus is telling here, right? To put it into our day. He's doing it to shock us into the reality of what it is when we reject the invitation of the gospel. It's a shocking offense, and there is a coming judgment for that. God has spread a feast before us in the gospel, and it cost him his own son on the cross. He's invited all to come now, and when we reject that offer, whether by indifference or outright hostility, it is unacceptable, not just rude, but a grave sin, an offense to God Almighty, an insult to the very glory of God. It is sinful rebellion against God. Understand, you're not neutral in this. You're not innocent in this, and you're not a victim. When the slaughter comes, it will be because you completely deserve it. You in wickedness have rejected the king's invitation. When a king with splendor and majesty and glory like Yahweh invites you to a wedding, it's not a suggestion. Like, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll come if I got nothing better to do. It is a command. You are expected to show up. It is wicked to reject the king's offer or act like other things are just more important than that. It belittles the very glory and honor of God. And therefore, this judgment of Yahweh in slaughtering everyone and burning the city is an act of justice. It's not a, you know, a little temper tantrum. It's justice. People who ignore or hate the gospel will get what they deserve. The king is angry. He has troops. Troops in the form of innumerable angelic hosts, warrior angels. One of which slaughtered 185,000 Assyrian soldiers by himself in one night. He doesn't need to send all his troops, just a few angels. While this parable has direct application to the coming day of the Lord that's coming upon the earth, Jesus here is explicitly prophesying about a very soon to come judgment on Jerusalem, the city, by the Romans, which would be the Lord's doing against Israel. And in 70 AD, so just 40 years after Jesus is saying this, 70 AD, this would still have been the time when the apostles were writing the New Testament scriptures. In 70 AD, the Roman general Titus came against the city of Jerusalem with his troops, killed some 1.1 million Jews, throwing their bodies over the wall, slaughtering countless thousands throughout all of Palestine, burning down the very temple of God and the whole city. And this was God's judgment on Israel for their rejection. No pity was shown to children or old people. All of them were massacred. And that was God's doing. And yet it is a foretaste of the outpouring of God's wrath that is coming upon the earth at the end of history, a day that we know is coming very soon. And worse than death, people are gonna be facing eternal consequences for their sins in hell. And so beware this morning God's judgment for rejecting this gospel. Fear, the king is angry. Which brings me to thirdly here for your notes. Go to the streets and compel sinners to be saved. Go to the streets, saints. Compel sinners to be saved. Look at verse eight with me. Verse eight, then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. God has provided this rich feast of salvation 
The Jews have counted themselves unworthy, rejecting their Messiah. And so God is going to still, he's going to fill the kingdom, the wedding house. He's going to fill the kingdom with grateful, ransomed sinners, primarily now from the nations of the Gentiles. Those who didn't get the first invite the way the Jews directly did in the Old Testament scriptures, but the gospel must go forth. The wedding hall must be filled because the feast is prepared, and this is for the honor of the Son of God. And guess what, saints? That work is not yet complete. That's the age we find ourselves living, all right? Gathering in in the days, the time of the Gentiles, the servants in the parable here represent us, the ministers of the gospel, the ones who've been sent out to, to bring them in, right? We, we are commissioned by Christ, as we say every Sunday, to go, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're to go out to them, bringing them into the kingdom of heaven. Paul says it this way, 2 Corinthians 5.20, God has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. This is what the servants are in the parable. They're the ambassadors, the messengers sent by the king with the king's message, with the king's authority, with the king's command to go and bring in as many as you can find. He says there in verse 9, go therefore to the main roads and invite as many as you find. Or as Jesus says it over in Luke 14, 23, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city. Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. How clear is that, church? How clear is that? Listen, I know it might come as a shock to some of you, but street preaching has always been the method of God to call sinners to repentance and salvation. It has. Noah was a street preacher, herald of righteousness. Ezra, Jeremiah, Jonah in the streets of Nineveh, Isaiah and Amos at the city gates, John the Baptist in the open air, Jesus preached his greatest sermon in the open air on the mount, right? Same with Peter on the day of Pentecost. Philip preached to large crowds on the streets of the city of Samaria. Paul preached to the entire city of Antioch and to other cities in the public square, in the marketplace, on the streets, and on and on and on. The examples could go biblically, as well as all the godly men of church history that we could point to that were street preachers. Today, it's a shocking and unseemly thing to see Christians actually preaching on the streets. Kind of, we're taken aback by it. Not doing that right, Christian. Whether it's open air preaching or gospel conversations with tracts, right? Or it's holding signs for cars passing by. Or just a directly approaching strangers to to talk to them about the, the gospel, to call them to, rep- to repent, to flee the wrath to come, to accept God's gracious provision of salvation through Jesus Christ. Most of Christendom frowns on such a practice today because we think now that we're smarter than God. Seriously. We have found today in our infinite worldly wisdom, that there's better ways to build big churches by just being really nice to people and building relationships and never calling anyone to repentance. That works a lot better for achieving our goal of a big church. And so we think we're smarter than God today, and we say, don't be like those jerks on the corner shouting at people. You mean preaching? lifting up your voice to be heard, preaching? Let me ask you a question, saints. Do you think Jesus had a soft conversational tone as he preached in the open air to tens of thousands without amplification? How do you think that sounded, right? 
No, no, you want the message to be heard. And so why, why, are we, why do we always use a pejorative like a shouting at people, you're yelling at people? The reality is we, we often paint this stereotype of street preachers as angry, shouting at people, pushing people away from God, because I think ultimately we're terrified to obey the command ourselves. We don't want to consider that that's actually what this might be what's happening in the book of Acts. I, I don't want to do that, Lord. Right? And so we're afraid of, of losing our reputation. We want to be accepted by the world. We're afraid of people's perceptions of us being less than ideal. Fear God, saint. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. And take the gospel to the streets with us. Amen. It's not about our reputation. He's commanded us to go to the highways and byways and compel sinners to come in for the honor of the Son the Lord Jesus Christ, it's for his glory. Our potential rejection or mistreatment or even death must not stop us from bringing the invitation because it's for the son's honor. It's for his glory. The wedding halls must be filled. The lamb who was slain is worthy of the reward of his sufferings. Bring them in, church. Go out, tell them of the king's gospel, and bring them in. And, and the wedding is starting soon. You hear me? So there's an urgency to this. There's an urgency. Compel them. Plead with them. Urge them. Implore them. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says. Beseech them. Because you really do love the son's honor, and the sinner who's perishing. We have opportunities to do this every day. Here at Wellspring, you can grab some gospel tracts on the welcome desk. I've made those available for the last few years. They're there. Grab them. They're good tools to use as conversation starters to get you going. Or we have awesome opportunities with the upcoming evangelism conference that Rob mentioned at the beginning of May. We're going to go to the streets. We're going to get training you can join Mason Saturdays at the Farmer's Market from 11 to 1 right here on Harvard. Just bringing the gospel to people. Join myself and Rob as we go up Mondays, Wednesdays, whatever day of the week to go to Springfield Planned Parenthood. Share Christ with, with moms and dads that are considering murdering their own children. Seems important. Seems like a good place to preach the gospel, right? I think, I wonder how many of us so the, the indifference to the gospel invitation, if you're here today and believing in Jesus, right, you're not indifferent to the gospel invitation. You're like, no, I'm, I'm in. I, I've received that forgiveness of Christ. But I wonder how many of us have become now indifferent to the Great Commission. That same kind of apathy of just going about your business and your farm. And, and we're indifferent now to this commission and pay no attention. Too many important things to do. And listen, here's what haunts me, church. Before you know it, you're 75, you're retired, you're declining in health, and you have spent very little of your life doing the things that you said were going to be the most important things for eternity. Just can't find the time. Isn't that an important, urgent warning for us this morning? I struggle with it too. Evangelize when it's convenient. I got a young family. Full plate. But I don't want to stand on that day and have a lifetime of thinking, what, what was I doing? Every weekend, something else more important. Something else that, that, that came up. Something else more urgent. Go to the streets compel sinners to be saved, to come into the wedding feast of our Lord. Number four for your notes. Beware God's judgment for false professions of faith. False professions of faith. Look at verse 11. When the king came in to look at the guests, so he's coming to survey those who've come, he saw that there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, 
how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. So here's the question you ask as you're trying to understand the story, right? How is it that this man is improperly dressed and the rest have wedding garments on? I mean, there, there must have been plenty of people who didn't come to the wedding ready, right? They were just taken up off the streets, the highways and byways, and, and they didn't have any notice for this wedding. So how is it that this is the only guy that doesn't have the right attire and the rest do? Well, it's clear in the parable that the king himself provided the wedding garment. The king made provision to the guests for the wedding garments, namely the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ that we need to be saved. God makes that available through faith in Jesus Christ. He has made the wedding garment available. And when you get invited to this wedding off the street, you don't have to go home and clean yourself up first. And you don't have to be worthy. You come. You come as you are. But if you're going to come into the wedding, you must put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only way. It's the only door of salvation. By faith, receive the forgiveness of Christ. And when you trust in Jesus, the very righteousness of Christ, his life, gets credited to your account. And you now have right standing with God. And you can enter the wedding hall. You have the only garment on by which we can enter. There is no other way. It says here, the king surveys the the guests and he sees this man who's present, but apparently he's rejected the wedding garment that was provided by the king, i.e. he's rejected truly submitting to the lordship of Jesus Christ, to receiving the righteousness of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ. So this is somebody who's responded externally to the offer of the gospel. You're coming around church now, you're calling yourself a Christian, right? You're... you're, uh, you're, you're saying, I'm part of this now. You've come to the wedding hall, but you don't have the righteousness of Christ through faith in the cross. You don't have personal faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ. And the king asked this man, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless, you see it says, right? He's speechless. Why? Because he was without excuse. He was guilty. He couldn't say anything because of his guilt because In reality, he was unwilling to take the king's wedding garment. He thought he could come into the kingdom of heaven on his own terms, wearing whatever clothes he wants. And this is insulting to the king. We see verse 13. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot, cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this awaits not only those who reject the gospel offer, but but also those who make false professions of faith that falsely convert to to try to be a part of this, right? Trying to come into the wedding, but not truly submitting to the lordship of Jesus Christ. What does Jesus say about this in Matthew 7, verse 21 that we saw? Many are going to say to me, Lord, Lord, Did we not cast out demons and do many mighty works in your name? I'm going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Why? Because not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And the king is going to cast people into outer darkness, right? So this this is a permanent judgment we're talking about here. This is forever being thrown out of the kingdom. And this is a judgment of eternal suffering, i.e. weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is torment. Beware God's judgment on false professions of faith, if that is you this morning. Are you a nominal Christian? By that I mean Christian by name only. You're identifying yourself as a Christian, but you don't actually live like a Christian. You say, Lord, Lord, but you don't do the will of the Father. In love for you today, I plead with you to repent and realize you're lost. You're lost if that's you today. Coming here, putting on the face, calling yourself a Christian, that doesn't save anyone. 
Realize you're lost, confess that to Jesus Christ, and come into the kingdom by truly humbling yourself, bowing the knee to Jesus Christ, receiving his forgiveness, receiving his righteousness through faith in him. It must be a personal faith in Christ. No other way. Be moved by that cross where Christ died to take up your cross and follow him every day. Follow him as a disciple. God is going to judge those who merely profess faith but do not possess faith. Which brings me to fifthly, and lastly here, verse 14. Trust God's sovereignty and confidently evangelize. He says there right at the end, but many, for many are called, but few are chosen. So many are called. The idea there is that the invite goes out, right? The servants take it to the streets. They invite everyone they meet, everyone they find there. And this is what we call in, in theology, the general call or the gospel call. In other words, it's the proclamation of the gospel. It's evangelism, telling people what God has done in Christ so that they can be saved but we know not everyone responds with faith and repentance. We know that. And in fact, Jesus says, with how many are just indifferent and those who are going to be actively opposed with all of that group, there's actually going to be very few that respond in faith. And then you notice here, though, Jesus doesn't say, but few will respond and be saved or few will come of their own free will. He says what? But few are chosen. So the man is cast out of the kingdom into outer darkness. So he, he, got the, he got the call, but he never repented. And Jesus doesn't say it's because he rejected the offer. It's true. He did. But Jesus says it's because he was not chosen. The Greek there could be translated elected. Now, here Jesus speaks very differently than we're used to speaking. And he brings up an idea that makes us very uncomfortable. But that doesn't mean it's untrue and certainly not something we should avoid in God's word. Here's the truth that I believe spans in the pages of scripture from Genesis to Revelation. God chooses whom he will save. And he chooses to pass over others and leave them in their just condemnation. God is gloriously free to save whomever he pleases. And that is all of grace. And it is not owed to anyone because grace by definition is free. It's free. Because God is God. He is free to do whatever he pleases and to save whomever he pleases. And that's grace because he didn't have to save a single person in the first place. And Paul says in Romans 8, 29, those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. In other words, the elect or the predestined will be saved. And God will be sure of it from beginning to end. It's the golden chain of salvation. God will see to it that they are saved. And this is all God's due. You owe your salvation all to God's grace this morning. Grace in choosing you in eternity past to be his, not owing to anything good in you or anything he foresaw in you that was worthy or something you were going to do first. It was gloriously free and unconditional, purely for the good pleasure of his will and for the praise of his glorious grace, he chose you, which ought to bring you, saint, to a place of going, why me? Why me? Why me? So many are lost. And here we stand this morning, saved by the blood of Christ. We were just as lost. We were just as hardened in heart. We needed the new birth as much as anyone else. We're saved. Why me? And that question will be a source of unending joy now and forever when you embrace the doctrine of unconditional election. Amazing grace. Now here's the point. The point in which Jesus is bringing it up, when, when it comes to evangelism, we the servants are sent out to call everyone to the king's wedding feast, to give the invite, right? So don't get discouraged though 
when people reject you or they're indifferent to what you have to say and, and they dishonor the king and they dishonor you, his servant, and the message that you're sharing, don't get discouraged because, listen, saints, the gospel will succeed. It will be victorious. Some will be saved because God has elected a people and they will respond in faith because he will draw them by the spirit to be born again and receive your message. It will be few, but they are chosen and they cannot be lost and they need the servants of Yahweh to take that message of Christ so that they can hear the call and respond and be saved. This church, I'm telling you, is the rock salt foundation that emboldens me in evangelism. The sovereignty of God in salvation. Christ's sheep will hear his voice and follow him. You know how freeing that is? People want to be like, oh, that reformed theology, like what's the point of evangelizing at that point? No, now you have a reason to evangelize because dead people are actually going to respond because God's chosen them. They're going to be saved. And I'm telling you, this frees you up. I, I don't have to feel this pressure in evangelism to try to make the message more palatable pleasing to the sinner, less offensive. I, I don't have to engage in, in deceitful bait and switch tactics. I, I don't need to, in my evangelism, seek to manipulate their emotions to try to make some decision and seal the deal. I, I don't need to, in my evangelism, first earn their respect and build a relationship. My job description is very clear. Go and invite. Go and preach. Go call sinners to repentance, and God will be sure to bring the growth and the fruit of his gospel seed planted in the hearts of all the elect, and they will be saved because God's word never returns void, and it accomplishes the purpose for which he sent it. Amen. We can boldly call sinners with the gospel because we're trusting God is sovereign. We're trusting God's going to use his word to save his people. And though many are called and they're not going to respond, some are chosen, so preach on. Preach on. And I hope that encourages you, saints, as we are continuing to seek to grow here at Wellspring in our faithfulness in evangelism and our boldness in evangelism as the people of God. Because, listen, as Jesus warns us in this passage, a day of judgment is coming very soon. The only hope is salvation found in Jesus Christ alone. This is an urgent message to get out. And oh, what a great God we serve today. Amen. A great feast has been prepared for those he has chosen. And what great love he's displayed in this glorious offer of the gospel. Let's worship in awe and joy. And let's bring that offer to the nations. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, have your way with your people. You are the head of your church, Jesus Christ. And I pray that if I've rightly exposited your word, then you would be honored by speaking that truth into their hearts and changing us and shaping us as a church to be this kind of people. In awe of the gospel and your sovereignty of our own salvation, humbled, Denying ourselves, taking up our crosses daily to follow you, shape us to be that kind of people, Jesus. A people passionate to bring the gospel to the lost, to the ends of the earth. Oh God, give us confidence and boldness and courage. We need it now more than ever, Lord. And this world needs your gospel now more than ever. And we sense, Lord, your return is soon. Help us be ready. Help us be ready, Jesus and to make everyone ready. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. Let's stand and respond with worship. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, oh my soul, worship His holy name.
strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise boxes here in the sanctuary and out in the foyer. Of course, you can go on notes.wbf.church to check that out. And uh, also in our mobile app, able to give. Let's finish off with one more song here. Just subscribe all of this praise for our wonderful and amazing sovereign God. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more.
Let's say this all together as a church. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Have an amazing week, folks. Go be salt and light.